Hello everybody, I am Jeremy Bourdonc. I'm quite new to Alter because I joined Alter last April. Um, I'm in charge of the product management and business development for a new product, which will be called PBS Cloud Manager. So yesterday you had a, a presentation from Jim presenting what we have done on cloud computing. So you know, you know that we have two products, HyperOx Unlimited Physical Appliance, which is our stack deployed on a bare metal machine uh, made by AGI and we lease that to our customers. And we have another product, which is HyperRox Unlimited Virtual Appliance, which is our oil stack on AWS. And these two products are a real success because we have dozens of customers using this stack on private cloud with physical appliance or public cloud with AWS. But today I want to talk with you about our new product, which will be PBS Cloud Manager. And Maybe you know this famous painting from the surrealist Margaret. It's the treachery of picture, of image. And this is not a pipe. Why I use this picture? Because today I don't want to make a presentation. I want to make an open discussion with you. Because our product is really new. We are starting our first line of code. And we had a big vision for this product, which is to develop a tool to deploy and manage scientific application on any infrastructures. So we had the vision. But what we didn't know is to have your needs about the cloud computing. It's a very large name. It's a large concept. And every of you, user or FPC, have several, many ideas about cloud computing. And we need to talk with you to have all the requirements to help to design properly this product. So Please help me today with an open discussion to make PBS better in the cloud with PBS Cloud Manager. So, first question. How many of you plan or already have some kind of private cloud technology or virtualization technology inside your data centers? One, two, three, four, five, okay. What kind of technology is it? Is it some VMware, Microsoft technology? No. Maybe it's OpenSAC? Yes? Two yes? So, do you know OpenSAC? OpenSAC is maybe the most exciting open source technology since Linux. There is thousands of people working on OpenStack. It's really impressive. And OpenSAC, it's open source, but I think it's the good technology for you guys if you want to use private cloud technology for making HPC. Yesterday we had a presentation for Mr. Matsuoka from Tokyo Institute saying that he's using KVM on his bare metal machine because he needs agility. And he said, that, I think it was in a question, that he lose 15 to 20% of the performance because of the uh, virtualization layer. So if you guys are using virtualization, for which reason are you using that? Maybe Andrew, yesterday I know that you have a, a, a virtualization and public cloud. Why do you use OpenStack? Sorry, uh, I name you because I know that you have <laughs> virtualization. <laughs> um, I think it's as simple as it's free and provides an orchestration layer on top of the already open source uh, virtualization stuff that we would be looking at. Okay. And you say it's free because you use an open source version from the community or you use a, like a distribution from Red Hat, Suzy, or Myrantis? So we've actually got a number of OpenStack installs over time. Um, okay. So we have had the Red Hat supported one. Okay. We've also had the open source one. Um, and we've also got one that's come through the Nectar environment within Australia. So um, sort of working with those guys. Okay. And for the guy who d choose to not use virtualization, why did you choose to not use virtualization? 
It's because of performance overhead? Say yes if you think that, so? No? No? So, why did you? If the question is about performance, maybe you know the new technology, the new kid on the block, I can say it's Docker. How many of you have heard about Docker? One, two, three, four, five, oh, many more. So just for the other one, Docker is a containerization technology. That means for virtualization like KVM, VMware, and so on, you have the bare metal, the OS, the virtualization, and inside the virtualization, you have another OS. So you have twice, two times the OS. That's why you have the overhead. But with containerization, you have bare metal, OS, container, and the application inside it. So it's much more efficient, uh, much more uh, efficient than the virtualization. That's why it could be a really good use case for HPC because you don't have so much overhead. You have a small overhead. Maybe, I don't know yet because we don't have many use case to, 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 to bench it, but it's something like five, maybe 10% maximum of overhead for the containerization. And you have all the agility providing by the virtualization. So it's very interesting technology to, to do that. Okay, the next point I want to talk with you, it's about cloud provider. You know there is a lot of cloud provider in the market. You have the big one, like the T-Rex one, which is Amazon, AWS, which leads the market from far, but there is another player, like Azure, Rackspace, uh, Google Compute Engine. So how many of you think to use a public cloud to push HPC application? Only one, two, three? Four, okay. And did you choose AWS or did you maybe bench other cloud provider? Google, Google Compute Engine? It would be a app. Okay. Well, we chose AWS because it had a, um, um, a virtual private cloud inside, you know, we VPC? actually could do a VPC. Yeah. Yeah, that way. And then, and then they also offered a, a really nice uh, uh, luster configuration. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Cluster management, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm French, and you know, French, we are strange. And in France, a lot of companies don't want to go in a US based cloud provider because they are afraid of big brother Leo. And that's why our government spent hundreds of millions of euros to found a cloud provider, what we call a sovereign cloud provider, to struggle with AWS and to allow some French company to use this cloud provider to not push um, data in Amazon or Azure or, or GC, even if the data center is located in Ireland. So I don't know if there is many people from other countries that US, but many of you working for a government or academic uh, company, do you have this kind of restriction for your government saying that you need to put your data in a national or a regional cloud provider? Or it's something only that French do? Yes? Some, some people do that? Or maybe it's only French that fear to put their data in Fran with that friends? Well, I think it's more of a, what can you do, what you're allowed to do, not what you want to do, really. <laughs> you know, because if you, we, we want to make it everywhere, but uh, there's, you know, because of the fact that you, you may have, you know, patient data. Okay. Uh, genomic data that's personal stuff and re you know, really revealing. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to be able to. Uh, um, it's almost like the ATM. Nobody trusted the ATM before with the you know, but now everybody uses them. So eventually, it's going to be that everybody trusts cloud providers like AWS because the fact is they have a really good encryption. They're always changing, or always evolving, things like that. So. Okay. 
another remark about cloud provider. You know, we talk about, when we talk about cloud provider, we talk about virtualization, but there is some bare metal cloud in the market, like provider like SoftLayer, which is a subsidiary of IBM, and they provide cloud functionality, but on bare metal infrastructures. Do you think that this kind of offer could be interesting for HPC usage? Because there is no overhead of the virtualization. It's direct bare metal machine. I think you should do the survey wandering your way down. Okay, everybody assume you're going to cloud. The, the CIO has said, okay, we're going to do it. Um, we're, we're, we're pushing off whatever 20% of our stuff off to the cloud. Okay, now, what are the problems? So, first, who, you know, if you were given a choice between, say, bare metal cloud and a virtualized cloud, would you, would you care? So, would you choose the bare metal cloud even if it was slightly more expensive? Okay. Would you not care at all? Were you not listening to me that you're all going to the cloud? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what was the other one? The other, the other question was about, um, oh, cloud, cloud providers. So you're all going, you're, remember, you're all moving your stuff to the cloud. You don't have a choice. Um, but you do have a choice of cloud provider now. Uh, do you have a restriction on which cloud provider you can do in terms of region? So are, are, now that you know you're going, do you, do you expect that, okay, they're going to force me to buy, get a cloud provider sort of in my, in my country or in my region in some way? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that was any better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next topic. Next one is about cloud security. I was talking with one of our customers about the security on the cloud and say, um, I would like that my data push on the cloud has to be encrypted. And I say, okay, what do you want to manage the key? And say, there is many possibility, but I would like at least that for each customers, each users, has a specific key to encrypt the data. But the best thing that I hope is there is a key for each job because like this, my job and my data associated to my, to my, to my uh, job will be encrypted um, directly and if there is a, a breach, only this job will be compromised and not the other job because there is another key to encrypt all the other jobs. So there will be the maximum security that they could have. And when we talk to other customers, and in fact, each NPC or IT in general, the first fear is about security. And maybe you remember yesterday about Jim Scappa said he met the customers and the customers say, I will never go on a cloud because it's about security issue. These guys, a few weeks after, have a breach and all the data for the management has been stolen by a hacker and come back to Jim and say, okay, I will go to the Amazon because maybe it's more secure than my own IT management. So yesterday we had a presentation from Mrs. Storm from Lockheed, Lockheed Martin, I think, about security. So she has a high level of security with labeling everything depending on security things and a lot of things like this. But security is a very important thing when you have to expose your workload outside your data centers because inside your closed and secure data center you are secure. But when you have to do some cloud bursting thing, you need to care about the security. So I will have a question about the security. So uh, do you think that if we put data on the cloud, like in the VPC from uh, Amazon where the data is isolated, you need to have the encryption of the data each time or that depend of the workload and the specific data? Is something that has to be mandatory or just optional? Mandatory? <laughs> By, default. By default? Optional? Okay, well. <laughs> In fact, when you connect to the, to the cloud, we will use a VPN connection to secure the connection between your data centers and the cloud, so the access will be secure. 
uh, I think that everybody thinks that it's mandatory to have this secure connection. I think you all agree with that. Do you have other um, my, um, uh, thought about security in the cloud? Encryption, user management, right? Anything about that? So I have a point to raise about your previous statement. Okay, if I set up a VPN between a, a cloud instance and my network, yep. I have now taken that cloud instance and brought it inside my security perimeter. Yep. I don't like that. You don't like that? Okay. Well right understood. <laughs> Well, there's different levels of that too. So you have a DMZ area you can do and set yep. up. So you, you can do that. But then, but but the biggest thing too is you know when when, when you're talking security is you know uh, you want to make the the data available to others even in your own company. Um, but some areas are not allowed to see the data because of uh, country restrictions, uh, group restrictions, whatever yep. it may be, um, or even engineering level restrictions so so the question is you know how do you go ahead and incorporate some kind of data stewardship over that data when you're doing it and that's where the kind of the equivalent internal cloud or external s3 would be really helpful too to have s3 capability where you have actually have roles and who can own what where and when and and uh, you, know, so, you know so you have to have some buckets some for the data uh, Buckets or containers for data. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I have so, a question about security for you. It's good. That's something I've actually thought about on my laptop. It doesn't really have to do with cloud, but. So you know, when I got when I got the latest laptop, it had an SSD in it, and so immediately I encrypted it because. You know the way SSDs work, yep. you can't erase them. Actually, <laughs> not not without a hammer or a blowtorch. Um, but I'm acutely aware, even when I did that with strong encryption, that it's only good for like five, seven years, and then you can break the encryption. So so my data is secure for five years, and then if I give my machine away and somebody who has a, you know, cracking thing can get it. Okay. So does that ever? Uh, is anybody worried about that with their data in in terms of sort of cloud that even in, even when you're encrypting all the data that that encryption is, is is only good for some small number of years as computers get faster <laughs> so i was on site Mike Carroll from Altair. I was yeah. on site at uh, one of our customers that was exploring options as far as cloud bursting. And one of their main concerns was protecting intellectual property. Okay. And even as Bill pointed out, if you encrypt something on a physical disk, uh, on an SSD, that over the course of time you could potentially get access to that IP. And the, the solution that I suggested was to create an in-memory file system and encrypt that. Okay. So the data itself is written into memory, which is volatile and can be completely erased when, it's, when, when the operation completes. It's transferred back across a secure connection when the, when the job is done. So okay. in that sense, you can completely erase all traces of what was there. Okay. Good point. But okay, cool. So the next thing that I want to, to talk is about uh, process. So I was looking on the internet to find a good picture to represent process and internal process. I didn't, didn't find anything. So I put this brewery process because it's a process that I like to follow, <laughs> especially the end. But so what I want to talk is about what is the policy and the process for people who want to push job in a cloud, like in cloud bursting process, to identify what is an eligible job to be pushed on the cloud. So imagine you have your data center and you have some access to a Amazon and you can push some job there. How will you select the good job to be pushed? 
for example, are you comfortable with a policy like that? I would like that behind my 85% of occupancy rate to my clusters, I push all the incoming job in the cloud. Is something you are comfortable with that or not? No, no, because it's too, too, bo too one zero, too, too Boolean. Okay, so maybe you are more comfortable to ask the customers, ask your user, to say if a job is eligible to the cloud or not. Maybe it's better for that. Yeah, okay. Or do you have use case where a whole bunch of job could be eligible? For example, non, um, non-sensible job or testing job or development job or maybe it's idiot but if you run an academic HPC, maybe all job coming from the master guys and going or licensed bachelor guys are going to the cloud and you keep the HPC for the PhD and the researcher. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good policy but something like this is something could be interesting. I mean the administrator selects the parameter to define what is a eligible, cloud, uh, eligible job to be pushed on the cloud or not, and not the, and not the user. Yeah, so we, we're, we're wrestling with that right now. So, so do we fully manage the IT resources in the cloud or do we hand it off to the users to manage? Okay. Uh, that, that's a that's a really good because if if right now I could go to I could go and grab my credit card, grab my AWS, uh, I, you know, uh, log in to my AWS public account, fire up Star Cluster, say I want uh, 50 nodes of Grid Engine, run my jobs, I get my stuff dumped off on S3, I copy them down to my laptop, I log out, I shut it down, and I go, and it's only cost me like like 20 bucks. So that that's really opening the door for a lot of people, but to to have a um, well, cloud bursting means we have to manage it. But and of it, so we we can give the users a possibility to fire up, for example, a PBS cluster yeah. in the cloud, run their stuff, get it off, and, and tear, build it up, run it, tear it down quick. Okay, really would be really been really be good. Okay, and in fact. In this case, how we will manage the cost? Because imagine you centralize all the cost for all the this expense in AWS. How you will manage the cost with like a hard limit, that saying that I would like to have maximum five thousand dollars each month spent in Amazon, and customers, user can use the cloud, the cloud, and when I reach five thousand, it stop for all the months. It could be a good policy to do manage the cost or it's too hard? And maybe the other question is, we can imagine that we put just a limit for each user. We could spend maybe maybe a thousand bucks for, for a month and each user has his own limit and when he reaches the limit is finished. Or maybe it's open and you will see at the end of this month how much is spent in Amazon. Maybe it's not a good solution for your CFO, but um, do you think that we need to have um, different policy to manage the cost in uh, Amazon, Amazon or, or the public cloud? Yeah. I, I really think like the cost cap is needed, like both soft and hard because a user is not always like, understand what they're submitting yep. and what the price model looks like. If there's any mistake in the job submission process, they may fire up instance like crazy and then end up they, they look at the bill and say, like, I didn't mean to spend that. But okay. they have to pay for it anyway. Okay. Very good. And uh, I think it was when Michael speak about the, the price this morning on, on the cloud, I asked a question about the sport market. You know there is some specific 
sport market in Amazon, what it called preemptible instance in GCE, the Google Compute Engine, and the price is 70% less cheaper than the classical price. And why is cheaper? Because at any time, Google or Amazon can preempt your instance to use it. That's why it's cheaper. But that means you have to run fault tolerant application on this uh, kind of instance because and in time you can have 20 nodes and sometimes maybe 15. So your application has to be built in fault -toler tolerant uh, application. So do you run this kind of application, fault tolerant application? Or, or your workload need to have a stable uh, clusters with no, <laughs> maybe we can have a direct conversation together. That, 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 that's, a really, that's a really good question. Uh, um, um, what I found out is embarrassingly parallel are great because you, you're going to expect failures anyways, even on the hardware, even on, even on the regular uh, uh, bare metal. Yeah. But uh, managing expectations and managing failures is, is, is part of the art of, of the cloud. And it's, it's going to be, have to be done on the application level. Not, appli not all applications are, 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 are good for the cloud and, and distributed. You may be able to have one big machine in the cloud, but it may cost you a lot of money, so. Okay, because I speak about that because I, I read an article about uh, one company that used this preemptible instance from Google to run, I think it was something like concert, 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 uh, a disease, desert, uh, concert resolution, and the application was by default fault tolerant, so it can lose a node, and they made, a really huge uh, computation with something like 10,000 K and something that spend normally a hundred of thousand K uh, dollars in classical uh, price in Amazon. So that's why I asked the question because. One other good thing too from the scheduler perspective, uh, what I really like about uh, PBS is the peering, it's peer scheduling. So it, in, in the cloud, um, when you get to be embarrassingly parallel kind of stuff, pull technology is, is really good. Pull technology. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's nice about the PBS, it already has pull technology with the peering. Okay. So you can incorporate that. I mean, that would be one of the ways I would do it anyways. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it was my last slide. So thank you for our collaboration. If you you will see in the coming months, maybe next year, more about PBS Cloud Manager. And, but if you want to talk with me about what is PBS Cloud Manager, to talk about your needs, and more face-to-face -face meeting, don't hesitate to send me an email or to have a contact with your regular alter uh, contact like Bill and other guy, and, and we'll be happy to, to set up a meeting. No general question about PBS Cloud Manager? Okay. okay. Th thank you. Good job.